Okay. I'll remind you that the first midterm in this course, this class, is on Monday. Uh, 30 questions, multiple choice. I w it was just pointed out to me that, that the midterm, first midterm for last year, as linked on the website, was broken. I just fixed that. Um, the, the, uh, the dangers of doing re replace all 2015 to 2016, I killed some of those links. So they're now uh, repaired. I'm sorry about that. Any questions about the exam? Yeah. Should you bring a calculator? No. If, 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 if a number shows up, it will be so simple that you would be, have been able to do it in, uh, you know, in grade school, in elementary school. Yeah. Uh, it's on paper, and you'll fill out a bubble sheet. Ah, bring a pencil. It actually, the, the bubble sheet reader needs pencil. If you fill it out in pen, which people do occasionally, uh, strangely enough, the, 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 it's an optical reader that does not see pen. It sees whatever wavelength it's using to make, the, the, to make its reading. It, it sees right through pen, and that, it looks blank. So bring a pencil. Uh, it will cover material through carousels and, and uh, roller coasters, which I'm going to touch on briefly today. Uh, I'm going to go into bicycles, but I'm not going to cover that in the, the exam. Other questions? All right. Uh, so things I, I finished uh, dealing with loop loops in such a flurry last time. I just wanted to make sure that I made uh, it finished the job on this carousels and, and roller coasters where really the, the issues are what you feel. We've already talked about acceleration in the context of sort of inanimate objects accelerating. You exert a force on them, uh, they accelerate, and the, their acceleration is related to the force exerted divided by the mass of the object. OK, what if it's you, if you're accelerating? And in that case, you feel the acceleration. You feel it as your own inertia trying to keep you from accelerating, all your parts. Uh, try not to accelerate. To make them accelerate, something's got to push on them. And the something is other parts of you, usually, or, or whatever finally is pushing on some part of you. So when you're on a carousel and the carousel is running, you're, you're traveling in a circle at a steady pace. Your, your, your own speed at any given moment is the same, but the direction of your travel keeps changing. You're, you're going first this way, then this way, then this way, then this way. And any change in velocity is an acceleration. So you are accelerating when you're riding the carousel. Which way are you accelerating? Well, toward the center of the carousel. Uh, if the speed isn't perfectly uniform, or if it's not a perfect circle, well, then you're not going quite toward the center. But the basic idea is there. So even if you're not on a carousel, but you're rather in a car, and the car is turning left, you're accelerating pretty much toward the center of that curve. You know, it's kind of like a circle, and, or part of a circle, and there's a center. And you're, that's the direction of your acceleration. And in order to do that acceleration, something has to push on you. You don't do it for free. Inertia requires you either go straight or something pushes on you and you bend. So, so uh, when you're traveling in a circular path, something's pushing on you. If it's a carousel, the horse you're riding, or well, I'm going up and down. I don't know whether I want you to go up and down on this idea. But the horse you're riding is pushing you toward the center. And if someone, some evil whatever, comes over to the carousel and makes it go faster and faster and faster and faster, that horse is going to be pushing on you harder and harder and harder to bend your path into a circle. Uh, if you lose contact with the horse and suddenly don't have anything pushing you toward the center, you're going to suddenly go straight. So I'm mean, just to, to illustrate this. This is, this is one of these. This kind of situation, you've you flung stuff around in a circle like this, and it sure feels like when you are this object here, and you you feel, gosh, you're like you're pulled outward. And if at the moment, I'm not going to actually do it, the moment when you're passing through like this, if suddenly you were to break free, it feels like you should go flying out that way. But that's not the case. You won't go flying out that way. Or if, you, or if you swing something around in a circle and you let go of it right here, it won't go flying out towards you guys. Instead, it will keep doing exactly what it was doing, as what inertia had in mind. 
Which direction was it heading at the moment? Well, I can ask us a question and show you the answer. It was heading that way at the moment it got to this point in, in the swing. And if I let go, or, you know, it goes that way. So I mean, I can do that. And if I remember to do it right, right, this, this requires me to pay attention right now, right? It just starts doing what it's doing. It doesn't immediately make a sharp right turn and go that way. It just coasts. And apart from gravity, it goes straight. OK? So you need that inward force to make you bend in a circle. If it vanishes, you suddenly go straight. And off you, off you go. Uh, there is just, I'll, I'll name it once, and then we'll set it aside. That outward feeling that you have when you're swinging stuff like this, if that's you, you feel pulled outward, it's often given a, a, a name. It's, they talk about it as centrifugal force. It's not a force at all. And so I should make air quotes with it, centrifugal force. It's just an experience. It feels like an outward pull, but there is none. It is the case, however, when I'm spinning this around here, that I am pulling inward on the ball, and the ball, in turn, is pulling outward on me. What the ball is pulling outward, the reason the ball is pulling outward is it needs a force to mend its path. That's me. I'm pulling inward. And it simply pulls back. Its own inertia allows it to pull back on me, not any additional force on it. Yeah? Am I doing negative work on the ball with the string? Interestingly enough, I'm doing zero work on it. And that's a great question. Now, why in the world am I doing zero work on it? It's moving like crazy, and I'm pulling hard. At, let, let's, let's take a flash photograph right when the ball goes here, right there. The ball is heading which direction at this moment in time? Show me that. It's heading to your right. And I'm pulling in which direction? Away from you. But that's at right angles to its movement. I'm doing no work on it, not because I'm not pulling and not because it's not moving, but because its movement is always exactly at right angles to its, uh, to its, to its movement is at right angles to my pull. So I'm neither increasing its energy nor decreasing its energy. I'm not transferring any energy to it, to the extent that I'm, that I'm really holding still and all, and there's no air resistance and friction and all that stuff. So I'm cheating a little. You see my hand wobble a little bit? Because I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I have to do that to keep it going because of real world troubles. But basically, it's trying to go with no energy. And this is, you know, it's actually, this is a great question because this is why when you go around a curve in a car, you don't have to hit the accelerator. You don't have to add, you don't have to use gasoline to make the curve to go, or a bicycle. You can go around that curve and you can maintain your constant speed and you've dramatically redirected your, your, your travel and all that. There's no work being done on you in the process. You're not changing energy. You're just changing the direction of your velocity. All the forces involved are exerted perpendicular to your movement. They bend your path, but they don't add or subtract energy from you. They do no work on you. Is that OK? Um, about the roller coaster part, in general, the feeling of acceleration, what you experience when you accelerate, is always in the direction opposite the acceleration. So if you accelerate to the right, you pick up speed whoosh, to the right, you feel this gravity-like sensation toward the left, opposite the acceleration. And the stronger the acceleration is, the stronger that feeling becomes. So if, 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 if I don't know, if it's a Mini Cooper and you hit the gas lightly, slowly forward, and you feel this gentle pull backwards. If you slam on, you know, it's a Ferrari, <laughs> and you leap forward or drag racer. Actually, drag racers, they, got, they, they accelerate like as much as three or four times the acceleration due to gravity. The person is really just yanked into their seat as though uh, they became super heavy backwards. OK, about the feeling of acceleration? It's opposite the acceleration. It gets stronger as the acceleration gets worse. This is a sensation that's very hard, impossible to imitate, except with acceleration. So all the, sometimes when you go to amusement parks, they sit you in some chair, turn out the lights, and they show you a video screen. They shake the chair around doing funny stuff. Is this still an experience you, you've, you've encountered? It's kind of hokey. And they change whatever you're watching with, as the years go by, and the 
the actors who did it die off and you have to replace them. So what they can't imitate is that visceral feeling of acceleration. They, they try, they're trying to use gravity to make a, a weak imitation of it by tipping you in funny angles so gravity itself gives you that experience of weight in funny directions. But they can't imitate, for example, a 5G turn on a roller coaster where you're whipped around so hard you feel five times as heavy as normal outward. Can't do it. All right, the loop loop itself, which is, I, mean, I should say, during the dive, uh, you feel extra light. You feel almost weightless. Why? Because you're almost falling. You're accelerating downward, almost in free fall. And consequently, you feel an upward feeling of acceleration that nearly cancels your experience of weight, of real weight, of, of gravity itself. You feel almost nothing. And we, we experience that as like this terrifying falling experience. We, we, know, we know that feeling, go, oh, no, I'm in trouble. Uh, you feel that it's sort of perfectly in the drop towers. When you go into one of these uh, amusement park rides where you sit on the chair, they often strap you in, whatever, and you, you're up high, 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 boom, and then they drop you, and you come down in free fall. And during that free fall time, you're accelerating the full acceleration due to gravity. You feel none of your weight. You still weigh the usual amount. However, you're being allowed to accelerate downward at full acceleration due to gravity, and so you, you feel this upward feeling of acceleration that perfectly cancels your experience of weight. You feel nothing. And hopefully you've all had that experience. Uh, it's brief. They can only drop you for about two seconds before you have descended so far that it, the tower had to be, would have to be taller and taller and taller. To, you, three, a three, two-second fall is, is about 20 meters, uh, plus the stopping time. They can't just simply drop you onto pavement. Uh, three-second fall, they need 45 meters, I think. It, it gets bad fast. And so a, a 10-second free fall, you can't do in normal every, you know, you can't make a tower that tall. Uh, that's, wh that's where these airplanes come into, into play, where the airplanes travel in the arc of a falling object. And they can go up and down thousands of feet. And they can give you the experience for tens of seconds of the, the experiences of free fall. When the drop tower, the pressure you experience when the drop tower first starts going down, or at the end, at the end, when you when they first release you, you know, before they release you, you feel your full weight. You're simply sitting in a motionless chair. Then they release the chair and allow you and the chair to fall, and you and the chair fall together like everything does. They, you know, there's, everything drops together, and so there's suddenly no pressure between you and the, uh, no forces between you and the chair. You're just floating, not floating there. You're falling there with the chair. You feel weightless. You can't tell you have any weight. But you go faster and faster downward. They eventually have to catch you if they just, you know, something bad's going to happen at the bottom. So they want to slow you down gradually. We all, we, this is, we've talked about this. They slow you down suddenly, you're in trouble because it involves giving up a lot of downward momentum in a hurry, which involves big forces. So you don't want that. So they slow you gradually to a stop. I don't know, what, you know how long they take and how much distance they cover during that time, but they've d they designed it to be reasonably comfortable. But during that period, you are going from heading downward fast to motionless again, which means you're accelerating upward. And when you're accelerating upward, you experience a feeling of acceleration downward, opposite the acceleration. You feel not only your, your, your weight now, but you feel your weight plus this downward feeling of acceleration. You feel extra heavy. So, so basically, you're, you're, it's very symmetric. If there's a period in which you're not experiencing your weight, namely you're falling, there has to be a corresponding period when you feel more than your weight to compensate. And, and it's, I mean, it's not a coincidence. And mathematically, it works out. It's, it, it has to be, uh, it's very symmetric in terms of momentum. You develop, you're accumulating momentum downward. You have to get rid of that momentum downward. Yeah. The question is, when you're in an elevator and you're moving at, at a constant rate, you feel heavier or lighter. Actually, when you're moving at a constant rate, 
and so you're at constant velocity, you should feel exactly your weight. It's, it's just like it were motionless. In fact, apart from little vibrations, you shouldn't be able to tell whether you're moving or not, because you can't feel velocity, right? It's motion, it's, if it's truly motionless, you feel your velocity is zero, you're not accelerating. You, shouldn't, you should feel no acceleration effects. If you're going up one floor per, per second, you should feel it's constant velocity again. You should just, apart from the vibrations, you should feel just your weight, nothing, nothing special. Going down, same thing. So, so you, can't, you can't tell you're moving apart from little clues. It's the same as if you're going horizontally in a bus, forward or backward, you can't tell. But you can feel the accelerations. And in an elevator, at the start of going up, you feel extra heavy because the elevator's accelerating upward. And that means that it's got to push up on your feet, and your feet have to push up on your ankles, and your ankles push up on your feet. All the, the internal stresses that give you the feeling of weight are being uh, boosted. You feel extra heavy. So on the, on the acceleration upward at the beginning, you feel extra heavy. At the acceleration downward at the top, when it's slowing you down, you feel extra light. Because now it's accelerating downward. Your feeling of acceleration, opposite your acceleration, is upward, and it partially cancels your weight. And I, and I hope you've had that experience on an elevator that really, really moves on a, on a fast on a, on a tall building. When you get toward the top and it's slowing down, you kind of feel like you're floating. You had this experience, or you jump and you, and you jump extra high. It's, you know, you, hit, you can hit the ceiling if they're on really big ones. But you, so you, you, can, you can leave the floor much, much more than you could do in normal stationary situation. It's re, I mean, these are, the feelings are real, plus you, um, I should say, the, some of these feelings, instruments will see them also. Uh, and so a, a spring scale will weigh light. It'll weigh you, if, if, you, if you're riding it, in the elevator. You're standing on the, a spring scale while you're riding the elevator. And this is, if you've got one, try it. Uh, when you start up from the bottom, heading upward, and it's, you're accelerating upward, the spring scale will read heavy, more than your weight, because it's pushing on you with more than your weight to help you accelerate upward. When you get to the top and you're accelerating the opposite way, you're slowing down and so you're accelerating downward, it'll read light. And the more aggressive the elevator is, so some of these modern tall buildings where they really take you up and down quickly. I don't know how low, how low it'll get at the top, but it might get to half your weight, something like that, enough that, it, that you, it's, it's, a big, it's a big effect. Other questions? Yeah, you, the, the same stuff happens on the way down, it's just reversed. About life at the t on, a, on a roller coaster, when you're not just going downward. When you go downward, you feel, and, and you're accelerating downward, you feel extra light. When you get to the bottom and you pull out of this dive, it's like the end of the drop tower. You're, you're accelerating upward, and therefore you feel extra heavy. You're, you're accelerating upward, therefore you feel this downward experience of gravity, uh, of, of acceleration. Uh, if they whip you around a curve, you feel you're accelerating toward the center of the curve approximately, so you feel this gravity-like sensation outward. The feeling of acceleration is away from the center of the curve. And on a loop-the-loop, so I did this in such a flurry, I, I, I probably left a lot of concept, a lot of the ideas behind. On a, on a loop the loop, so if I, I mean, we talked about this, this is accelerating toward the center, right? And I can do the same thing vertically. So now the ball, if I go fast enough, the, the, the path of the ball would be almost perfectly straight. Gravity becomes so unimportant in this story that we can kind of leave it out. This ball is trying to go straight, and I am f pulling hard toward the center to bend its path into a loop, and it's accelerating hard toward the center, way more than gravity would make it accelerate. It's bending its path. It's traveling fast. It's bending quickly. I'm running out of thumbnail. Um, and so that trip over the top involves an acceleration toward the center, which is downward, that's big. It's bigger than gravity ever had in mind. And for that to happen, I've got to pull downward hard on the ball to bend its path into a loop. And if I do that with a ball, okay, I'm pulling, in from the, pulling inward from the center. If I do it with my book, the usual book, if I go over the top fast, at that moment at the top, the book is accelerating downward faster than it would do if it were falling. If I let it fall at the top, 
hate to do this in a book, sorry book. That's the path it takes when it's falling. You, you saw it. Okay. I've had it since graduate school. It's, it's calculus on manifolds. It's, it's the, what is it? It, it, it's all about, about motion and paths in space. So that's why it's an in-joke. I should never have started. So, so you saw when he got to the top, and I just simply let it fall, it travels like this, the arc of a falling object. But I'm not letting it do that. I'm bending it even more than that into this tight loop. And so for that to happen, although gravity is helping me, gravity wants to, you know, you know gravity says, ah, you know, I'll help, I'll help. We'll pull down, we'll pull. But, but, I, but this is how hard gravity will bend it. I want it to bend more. So I, gravity and I have to work together. I have to help gravity pushing inward. So at the top, my hand is pushing down on the book, helping gravity bend its path. So the book is pushing up on my hand. We're, we're stuck, we're gripping each other. Yeah. So Very. Yes. The question is whether, in, with the ball, we talked about no work being done. Is the same true here that I'm doing no work on the book? And the answer is pretty much yes. I've got to be a little careful if we include gravity, how we, how we do it. But basically, I'm pushing inward on the book still, pretty much, as it is traveling in a circle. So it's traveling along the circle, or sort of tangent to the circle, and yet I'm pushing toward the center of the circle. That's at right angles. So I'm doing no work on it again. At the very start, I, do, I definitely do to work. I get, it, I get it moving for the first time. But normally in a roller coaster, you come into it moving already. So if you think about a roller coaster track, uh, has no sources or it has nothing, it can't provide energy or take it back. It's just letting the car roll. So the track of a roller coaster, which never moves, you hope, um, never does work on the, on the roller coaster either. Just at the beginning when they take it up the hill or when they fire it from some cannon to get it going. Afterwards, it's just a roller coaster. Coaster is the key word here. It's going, up. it's not, well, it's going on its own. Is that okay? Questions about that? So at the top, I'm pushing down on the book. The book, sh book is pushing on me. We're gripping each other. And this is, for those of you who've ridden a, a, a proper loop the loop the kind where, really, where you go through it fast, uh, you feel pressed into your seat because the seat is pressing against you, bending your path into that loop. So you and the seat are like this. Similarly, the coins and the, the cat on your head, they're all pressed against you because, for example, your head is bending the path of your hat to travel in that loop. So you don't lose your hat going over the loop loop. You, coins don't come out of your pocket going over the loop loop because your pocket is responsible for bending their path into that loop. If, if you were to lose something, your glasses fall off, just come loose. Just as you hit the top, your glasses become falling objects. And they travel in the arc of the falling object, which is long and out here. And the, and the car is bending faster. It'll catch the glasses. It come, it's coming down so fast, it will actually catch the glasses on the way down, like, like a, falling, a falling ball. And it'll, it'll grab the glasses. The glasses, from your perspective, will, will drop upward, seemingly, into the bottom of the car. Nothing gets lost. Is that a, can you follow that idea? That stuff is coming down so fast it catches the things that, that break loose. What's the alternative to this? There are plenty of other amusement park rides that take you over the top too slowly. They don't make you accelerate downward fast during that loop. Either there are these corkscrew curls that you do slowly like this, or the berserker things where they're swinging back and forth on a, on a pirate ship, and they sit up here for a while. In those cases, you are not accelerating downward very fast. You, f you feel very little acceleration due to gravity. It's mostly your real weight, which is now pulling you toward the ground, obviously, and you're hanging. And the things, your hat, your glasses, the coins in your pocket, 
if you, if you fail to support them properly, they will fall all by themselves. And so uh, if you want to make money at the amusement park, stand with your basket underneath the slow corkscrew turns where they basically hang the people upside down and shake the money out of them. Or the berserker where they hang them upside down and shake the money out of them too. Is that okay? Any other questions about roller coasters? Yeah. Yeah. The question is when you're on one of these dropping amusement park rides where, where they drop you and you have a coin sitting in your hand and it floats, what's going on there? And I, I did this once before. I'm a little hesitant to try it again. I'm, just, I'm, I'm rolling the dice every time I jump off the table. Um, but, but if I'm in free fall and the ball's in free fall, we fall together. So it's, it, it's hovering in front of me because we're both falling objects. And like all falling objects, we all fall together. So if we have this sort of the same history, I, I'm falling, wah, down they go. The ball is falling. It doesn't scream because it's just a ball. Um, so it's an inch above my hand, and it stays an inch above my hand. We just, we're just going fast. We're accelerating downward, but, but we're making progress at the same rate. So that, that's, that's what's going on. If it started exactly on your hand, it'll stay exactly on your hand. It shouldn't rise off your hand unless there's something pulling you down and making you accelerate faster than the acceleration due to gravity, in which case the coin will get left behind. So it, it, it should just really float. And, and I should, should say, in, the, in, the, in those airplanes where they take the astronauts or the trainees or whatever in, in the arc of a falling object, stuff does sort of float around there. So, you, so you've seen pictures of this. I mean, the Apollo 13 movie was filmed in, in, in part in one of these planes and everything's sort of floating. They're all falling together. And finally, for astronauts circling the Earth, they are not weightless, first off. The astronauts in low Earth orbit weigh almost the fu their full weight. It's the force on them due to gravity is nearly the same as it is on, on the ground. They're a little farther from the center of the Earth, but not much. So they're falling all the time. They no make very little progress toward the Earth because they're going sideways so fast that as they fall and, and, and arc downward, so does the surface of the Earth. It's curved, after all, right? So it's curving away out from underneath them, and they make very little progress towards the Earth. And they end up circling it in what's called an orbit, rather than actually hitting. If they weren't going sideways, it would be bad. But because they're going sideways, even though they're falling, they make no progress. But all the stuff that's floating around with them, it's not because there's no gravity. It's because they're all falling together. The, the astronaut in the middle of the spacecraft is falling. The spacecraft is falling. Everybody else falling all together. Yeah. Where's the maximum acceleration in, in which context? In the roller coaster. The maximum acceleration in roller coaster, it's, it's a little hard to, to judge, but it's going to be in the tightest turns when you're going fastest. Some combination of those two. So the, the, the more rapidly it bends your path uh, when you're traveling fast, the biggest, the, that's where the biggest acceleration is going to occur. And that actually limits the tightness of the turns, particularly when you're down low and traveling fast. When you're way up high in a roller coaster, typically a lot of your energy is tied up as gravitational potential energy. When you're down low, you've got less gravitational potential energy. Where did that energy go? It's not going into the track because the track isn't doing work on you one way or the other it goes into your kinetic energy. So you're traveling fastest near the bottom, slowest near the top. This is surely familiar to all of you. Think back to your experience on a roller coaster. So you're fastest at the bottom, and if they put a tight turn, either, either up and down or around a curve at the bottom, you feel this tremendous acceleration. So the tight turns way up high, not so much, because you're not going fast enough to make for that bend to be uh, a big acceleration. But down low, when you're going whipped around the turns at high speed, now the acceleration's huge and you feel super heavy. And they actually have to be careful with this. Um, some of the rides, there was a, King's Dominion had something called the hypersonic for a while. Is that familiar to any of you guys? It came and went. I think it, I think it had excessive accelerations in it. And, among other things, 
uh, and it, during the t we, we watched the test runs in which parts of it were flying off. They'd, they'd go up over this, it, it would go shoo, up and down, and we would watch pieces of the, of the, um, the seats, the foam and stuff, would, be, would, would go inertial or, or become falling objects. It was fun. I never wrote it. My wife and son did. I don't know whether they liked it or not. I can't remember. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, is, is when you're riding an airplane that travels in the arc of a falling object, which the nickname for these airplanes are vomit comets, because actually I should say the, the experience of weightlessness for one or two seconds is just terrifying. For, for, for a day, for a long period of time, is nauseating. And so some sig significant fraction of astronauts in orbit doing free fall uh, become nauseated and, and, and mostly not on camera for obvious reasons. But OK, so, so when you're in this airplane doing these, these long arcs of a falling object, during the time when the airplane is literally following the path that a falling object would follow, and they may, they, they, could, they could reasonably have a falling object and be watching it to, to, to track the plane's path. You feel no weight because you are, that, that movement is, the plane is, is basically imitating a falling object, and everything inside it then, protected from the outside wind, is able to travel according to its own motion the path of a falling object. So that's when you feel weightless. You feel you're accelerating during that, that arc. Everything in the in the plane is accelerating downward at the full acceleration due to gravity and feels no weight. Okay, even though they're going upward and sideways, doesn't matter. They're still accelerating downward at 9.8 meters per second squared. Simple. Uh, at the bottom, though, you have to pay the piper. When you come back down, to not have trouble, they have to pull out of the dive and, and reverse the whole course. And during that time, you feel extra heavy. For about the same amount of time you felt weightless, you're sort of paying back. You get 10 seconds of weightlessness, you get 10 seconds of feeling twice as heavy as normal to pay back. OK? Can you feel weightless at the top of the swing? You, you can. You probably have had this experience. If you swing hard enough, and you get to the top of the swing, and you're heading uh, almost, you're almost out sideways relative to the support. The support, it can only pull on you horizontally when you're like that. You have no vertical force exerted on you by the swing. And at that point, the only force acting on you vertically is your weight. You fall. So if you, go, if you swing out far enough, you become a falling object briefly. And you feel no weight. You know, I, there too, I hope you've all had that experience. You swing, you swing hard enough, you feel extra light at the ends. Because you're briefly pretty much falling, and then you swing back in the loop. All right. I think that, that probably should do it for the, the feeling of acceleration associated with all these amusement park rides. So let me go on to another topic, which is bicycles. And bicycles, the, sort of the underlying my motivation for talking about it, you, got, you could do a, a, a semester course on bicycles. But the, the points I'm looking at really are a lot about stability. The fact that we ride these things that have two wheels makes no sense, and yet we do it. Right? Why don't we all ride tricycles? So that's, that's my, the, my story. OK, so as an opening question here is sport utility vehicles in general. Uh, over the years, some have come and gone that were especially tall, or, uh, or people just, just because they want to put monster tires and giant suspensions on their, their cars or trucks and make them extra tall so they feel like they're driving a, you know, like they're a trucker. Um, how does raising the height of, this, of the SUV or whatever like that affect its stability when turning? You okay with the question? How many think that it, that it makes it less likely to tip over during a turn? How many think it's more likely to tip over during a turn? Okay. And no over effect. Yeah, I know you got it. It's, it's, it's not my, my most <coughs> sophisticated question. It turns out that vehicles with four wheels can be nicely stable at rest 
or when traveling in a straight line at steady pace, as in being inertial. But during accelerations, such as turning, they can become unstable. And that's finally the reason why we, we don't ride tricycles, most of us, as adults. So that's where we're going. Some observations about bicycles in general. Uh, they are very hard to keep upright while stationary. There are people that can do this. You've watched people on tracks jockeying, you know, the, 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 the racer is trying to jockey for position on the last lap. They will actually sit there and stand on their bicycle and keep their feet on. But this is, this is really hard. Um, so stationary bicycles, unstable, seriously. When they're moving forward, they can become remarkably stable. So they stay upright. They stay upright to the point where, where you can ride them without hands. Uh, and you've seen people do that. And the little secret behind it is, is the bicycle can ride itself without hands. If you've ever uh, rolled your friend's bicycle down a hill, you let it go, ha <laughs> ha, it rides all by itself. Your friend wasn't so cool after all. Your, your friend's bicycle did the job without your friend. Okay, so we'll see why, that, why that's possible. So the first question then to go after is, is why is a stationary tricycle so stable? And we'll, then we'll look at why a stationary bicycle is unstable, and then we'll look at the uh, reverse when you're moving. So a stationary tricycle, why is it stable? And the, the idea behind a uh, tricycle being stable is, is that it has a stable equilibrium, and that's where you, where you are most of the time. And I, just to illustrate this, I don't, all these years, and I've never gone to Toys R Us or something and gotten a tricycle. So I'm, I'm always have to make do with a four-wheeled, wheelless tricycle, namely a chair. A chair is a stable object to rest, just like a tricycle is. What's stable about it is, first off, it's got an equilibrium. I'm there right now. The net force on me is zero. So that's an equilibrium. And if I tilt this thing in any direction I like, restoring forces ap appear that tend to push me back towards the equilibrium. So it's a stable equilibrium. I talked about stable equilibria a week or two ago. And I'll leave my tricycle for a second. A stable equilibrium, an example thereof, is, is a ball at the bottom of a bowl, or this is a, a linear track. The ball at the bottom is, is in equilibrium, zero net force. And if I take it away from equilibrium, it's now ridden a little bit up the ramp. It, it, it experiences restoring force that pushes it back. And it, uh, it's now oscillating about the equilibrium, which is a whole interesting story. And we've done that a lot with uh, like the spring scale stuff. But it will eventually settle at equilibrium. Most importantly, though, it, it, it's, the equilibrium is stable. It, you, you naturally go back to it. And that's true here in, 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 for the tricycle as well. Why? Why is it stable? It's stable because it's at, when at the equilibrium point is the point of lowest available total potential energy. Do I have that on this? Yes. Remember objects accelerate towards in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible? It was an idea that I introduced in bumper cars, sort of as a throwaway at the time. It was just like I, I pulled a rabbit out of a hat and, and, and told you this. But I told you that, that objects, well, we know they accelerate in the direction of the net force on them. But sometimes it's too hard to figure out where, what the net force is. It's just messy. So instead, set aside the forces and look at potential energy. Potential energy, after all, is energy stored in forces. So they're related. It's not, it's not like the world of forces and the world of potential energy are just completely unrelated. They're, they're intimately related. And if you look at total potential energy and you, and you find the direction in which you can reduce the total potential energy as quickly as possible, that actually is the direction of the net force. And so this ball is at it, the lowest available potential energy. The only potential energy it's got worth speaking about, I mean, unless it's made out of plutonium, uh, in which case, ah, okay. It's only potential energy is gravitational. So if I roll it away from equilibrium, it goes up. It's higher now than it was before. So it's, it's increased its total potential energy. 
And if I let go, it will accelerate in the direction that reduces its total potential energy as quickly as possible, which is back toward equilibrium. So the point is, look for total energy, total potential energy, and a stable equilibrium is one in which any disturbance away from equilibrium causes that total potential energy to increase. And it wants to go back. Is that OK? Questions about that? Any, so, so, so watch me on my crazy tricycle here. Any tip that I make lifts me a little upward. It raises my center of gravity. That is me and the chair together. We go a little upward. Um, an extreme case of this would be a book. So this book, its, it's effective, it's, its center of gravity, the effective location of its weight is somewhere under my finger, right? And any tip I make of the book lifts that, that point, and with it, the book's total potential energy, its gravitational potential energy, by and large. Okay, so it experiences a restoring force pushing it back. So the book is the book is stable. Any tip, it goes back. So with a tricycle, same thing. Any tip causes the the, the rider and tricycle's center of gravity to rise, and with it, their total potential energy. So they tend to go back. There is a lovely recipe for figuring out circumstances in which an object's gravitational potential energy will increase if you tip it. And the recipe is this. So this is just simply useful. It, it, it's not like, yeah, it's, it, it's a useful observation. Any object sitting, say, on a table uh, or on a surface uh, contacts that supporting surface at certain points. And those points map out a polygon, some shape, on the, on the surface they touch. In the case of a chair, which is a simpler story, I'll just bring the chair up first. The four contact points are here, here, you, you got them, right? That describes a square on this surface. And that square shape is given a name. It's called a base of support. And that square there, that's part of the recipe. The other part of the recipe is the center of gravity of this object. And if I were on it, you'd have to include me. But the center of gravity of the chair is somewhere right around here, maybe. Maybe it's under my finger. You know, it's about here somewhere. As long as this point, the center of gravity, is vertically above the base of support. So drop a line dee -dee -dee -dee, down there, touches there. It's in the square. It's within the base of support. Then the recipe says we are in a stable equilibrium. What's the alternative? If I tip this guy like this, and I have a, I have a suppose I have a, a sloping uh, table. I don't even, you know, imagine I could tip the whole table. So the base of support is still a square. It's sitting there. But the center of gravity is now, it's, it's over a spot here outside the square. Can you visualize that? This thing is now unstable. It tips over. And the little, drop, the little tower here, this, this little guy, can you see that it's got a little plumb bob there? I guess I could zoom in. Let's get in there. Let me zoom the camera in. Zooming and panning. And now I'll stand in front of it and ruin everything. OK. See the little plumb bob ha hanging here, this little guy? OK. That's <laughs> pendulum again. I will stop. Stop, buddy. OK. The center of, ma center of gravity sorry, is right here. And there's the little, the little plumb bob showing that, that it's above the base of support. But if I tilt this, let me, how do I, where I tilt it? I want to rotate it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. If, I tilt, if I rotate it, there. It's, the plumb bob is, is just barely over that base right now. So the plumb bob, this is the center of gravity. It's, it's right over, right about this point. It's just inside that square base of support. If I tip it a little bit further, ah, 
died just over. So the, the, the recipe really works. If you take the center of gravity, and as long as it's over that base of support, you're good. Take it a little over, you're in trouble. And uh, where does this come? This now gives you an, an idea of some of, the, some of these very tall vehicles. If they're on a slope, it is possible for a very tall vehicle center of gravity to drift outside the square of it made, uh, described by its four tires and tip over. So if you're in a tall, a tall vehicle on a slope, you're driving on a mountain. You're, 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 I don't know for what reason, but you're on a mountain. It's possible for that very elevated center of gravity to fall, to, to be vertically above a point outside the square formed by the tires, and the thing tips over. On the other hand, a very uh, low-slung vehicle, one that's got four tires way out far, perhaps, and it's, it's only inches off the ground, that thing will be very hard to tip over on a slope because it's very hard to take it so far away from uh, horizontal that its center of gravity stops being above the square described by its tires. All right, so that's life on a tricycle. How about life on a bicycle? Hmm? Oop, oop, thank you. Back. I just wanted to. Uh, why a stationary bicycle is unstable. So, so, what if, so, so where, that, where that shows up is, what if you have an equilibrium, but it's an equilibrium in which any disturbance from equilibrium summons restoring forces, ah, summons forces that are not restoring, anti-restoring, that push you away from equilibrium. And an example of that is this. So, so if I flip the track upside down now, the ball can still go into equilibrium. There's still an equilibrium available, but I'm having trouble finding it. Uh, I got close. This, incidentally, is a maximum of total potential energy. At this point, it's at the top of its possible gravitational potential energies. It's as high as possible. And as long as it's right there, it's good. I, I mean, some days I can get it. Some days, ah, I almost had it. But as soon as I disturb it, it falls over. Ah, close. OK, I, I'm going to give up. As soon as it got away from the equilibrium point, it, the direction in which it could reduce its total potential energy as quickly as possible was not back towards the equilibrium point. It's away, and over it goes. And another example of that same story is a, is a broom. So I try to balance a broom on its tip. It is possible to get it into equilibrium if I put its center of gravity exactly above the tip. But as soon as it's anywhere uh, away from that equilibrium, it develops force, forces and, 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 and or torques that take it away from equilibrium. The solution to unstable equilibria, which I'll, which I'll talk about next time, so um, just, to, just to finish that thought, bicycles have no base of support. Why? Because they touch the ground at two points. That describes a line, not a base. And when it's perfectly upright, the, the bicycle is in an unstable equilibrium. It's, it can have no net force on it and, it, and it can, in principle, stay there. If it was motionless there, it can stay there. But the slightest touch, and over it goes, because it develops forces that push it away from equilibrium. Basically, it's, it's trying to reduce its total potential energy, and it goes over. The solution to an unstable equilibrium, as we'll see next time, is to continuously fix it. Keep returning the thing to its unstable equilibrium. And you can do that with a broom. Uh, and we'll talk about where you look when you do this. You don't look at the tip. You don't look at your hand. You look at the center of gravity. And I keep putting my, my hand right under the center of gravity. And I'm fixing an unstable equilibrium. And that's what a bicycle does. When it's heading forward, it keeps driving itself under your center of gravity to keep, to keep returning you to, this, to the unstable equilibrium. And it does this so effectively and, and independently of you that the bicycle becomes stable in motion to the point where you can take your hands off the steering wheel um, and, and, you know, text people um, if you're crazy. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I'll finish this, this up. Not on Monday since it's the exam, but on Wednesday.